In our last video, we introduced how we used Dart FFI to construct a retro music player for the terminal. As we saw, our experiment not only plays music, but also draws real-time waveform and note data on screen. We also discussed how this experiment works by reviewing the architecture from a high-level perspective. Today, we'll be doing a deep dive into the C and C++ side of things and discuss how audio is generated and ultimately heard. If you've never programmed in C and C++ before, don't worry. The content of this video will be kept at a high level, and I'll explain key concepts along the way. Let's get started. To kick things off, we'll do a quick refresher of the C and C++ part of the architecture. Now, the compiled side of our experiment is responsible for generating audio and routing it to the operating system to be heard. This is possible via three main components, Live Open MPT, Live Port Audio, and our very own Live Dart Open MPT. You're probably wondering, what do these components actually do? Well, here's how these components play a role in the architecture. Live poor audio is what we use to spin up threads to communicate with our operating system sound card drivers, ultimately leading to our music being heard. Live open MPT is what's used to generate audio via real-time synthesis of samples and note data contained in the song files we use. If you want a deep dive into the song format, please let us know in the comments section below. Our very own Live Dart Open MPT is what manages the orchestration of opening files and ultimately the audio handoff between Live Open MPT and Live Port Audio. This module contains two source files, OpenMPT.cpp and SoundManager.cpp. SoundManager is what does all the heavy lifting that we described above. Meanwhile, OpenMPT is the program responsible for making sure that SoundManager's functions are accessible to Dart FFI via C using the extern C keyword. This is necessary because Dart FFI does not have the capability to use functions directly from C++. To test this outside of Dart, we have an example C++ program that calls many of the functions that Dart would and plays the music in the terminal without any of that fancy waveform rendering. This is where we're going to begin to look at some of the code. We have our terminal open as well as an IDE so that we can execute our program. Let's actually build the project first. So I'm going to type in bash make library.sh. If I jump into the build directory, I'll be able to find that we have two executable files. One is going to be the dynamic library. If you're on Mac OS 10, it's going to be a dynamic library, .dylib. If you're on Linux, it's going to be a .so or a shared object. So the actual executable we're looking for is going to be open mpt test. And so if I run that and I specify a sound file to use, let's try main menu.xm, we can hear audio being played. Now, this is important because it tells us that our app is actually working. The implementation of live port audio as well as live open MPT is working as expected. Now, what we also see is that we see note data being rendered and it looks kind of not correct. So if I resize my terminal, then it starts to look more like it should. In fact, if I cancel my program running and I open up Milky Tracker, this is what the output looks like in a, a tracker. And this allows me to verify that my version of their program is, is working fine. So if I scroll up, I can see that we have A4, E5, E4 in the first pattern. And if I stop and go back to the first pattern, we will absolutely see, eh, ig ignore <laughs> the numbers here. There's a difference between the starting octave uh, between Milky Tracker and OpenMPT. So we'll just put that aside. Nonetheless, the data is pretty solid. Now let me walk you through how the example code works. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take a look at the main function. Now main's going to take essentially an argument, which is our file name. And if we don't have it, we exit. So if I test this out, hey, we need a file name. Duh, works, works fine. Um, now, we also register a signal handler. Our signal handler essentially is going to listen for something like control C. And so if we look at interrupt handler as a function that's being passed, as, lo as, as long as that interrupt is being passed through something like control C, we're going to exit gracefully. Now, we stop the music. We also execute a shutdown. And we can walk through those functions in a little bit. Now, our main function will then 
open our mod file. If it doesn't work, we'll exit. However, if it does work, then we're going to grab some of the information from the file. The information includes things like the author, all the note and pattern data, as well as the duration, and a couple of other attributes. And that's how we get something as the title. So for example, if I execute this again, you'll see mod info.title equals main menu, and that's because it's the name of the song. And we can see that here in our tracker. Now, once we've successfully opened the mod file, then we're going to implement or execute play underscore music. And essentially what that's going to do is make sure that we essentially start the thread, the audio thread. So let's look into, um, actually before we do that, we'll talk about the run function. So in order to not exit the program, we need to create a run loop that is its own separate thread. So this is our, essentially, you can consider it our main thread. And so run essentially will go through um, and listen to or, or, or check to see where we are in the song every 5,000 milliseconds. And then it will update the screen if necessary. So if we have passed a certain threshold in the song, so it's going to be, um, let's print the current row of the current pattern of the current order. It's kind of how the, the song files are orchestrated. So an order is essentially how you organize patterns. Patterns are a collection of notes. And a row is essentially a, a connection, collection of notes that are being played per tick, so to speak, in, in the sound file. So we can actually make some changes here. But before we do that, let's take a look at our OpenMPT CPP. So earlier, I mentioned that we use this program to essentially expose functions to Dart. And these are functions that we are actually using in our example. So if I split this screen, you'll see functions like stop music, play music. And if we look over here, all we're doing is executing sound manager play. That's all we're doing. But all of these functions collectively are exposed to C using the extern C keyword. We're not going to go any deeper than that, but just know that it, it exposes these functions. And so by wrapping our C++ functions in very simple functions and using wrapping that in extern C, we can expose our code to Dart. In the next video, we're going to go through how we implement these functions on the Dart side. But for now, just know that that's what this is here for. Now, Sound Manager itself is where things get quite hairy from the lower level perspective. So we're just going to go through it pretty fast. We start with uh, initialize. So when we initialize, we're essentially asking live port audio to basically set up the underlying architecture to enable us to route audio data to the sound card. And so we do that using some functions that port audio exposes to us. And if that doesn't work, then we essentially will have to exit the program gracefully. So an example use case would be we're trying to initialize a sound card that is just not accessible, or maybe doesn't have the capability to render something like a 32-bit floating point or something like that. So know that this is what we're doing here. Now, if I scroll down, um, not only are we initializing uh, the poor audio side, but we're also allocating memory. So we do this because we need regions of memory that are contiguous. We, they're called sound buffers here. And that essentially is going to be leveraged by Dart in the future to render real-time waveform. So there's a function that essentially is a callback. And so when we implement live port audio, we have to register a callback. And so it creates a thread or a series of threads that manages what's called a ring buffer. And that ring buffer essentially is a collection of buffers that has audio data that we're going to populate at some point. Well, this callback is what does that population. So when a buffer has been used and has been marked to be filled, it executes the callback that we've registered. That's this function. And then our job is to fill that buffer with information that is ultimately going to be sent through the ring to the driver at some point. And so the information that we're filling it with essentially is the output of what Live OpenMPT does. Live OpenMPT is going to take our sound file 
and it's going to take the notes and the samples, synthesize per track how the audio is supposed to be played, and then kind of mix that together. And then we actually pass the, uh, the array of floating point numbers to Live Open MPT, and then after it, when it does a synthesis, it actually will start to plot that audio data in there. Now, we have an opportunity to kind of siphon off that data at some point and expose that to Dart, and that's what we do here. So let's walk through this. Essentially, the very first, when we enter the callback, what we're essentially doing is saying, OK, if we have an underflow situation, underflow is where the sound card is, or excuse me, the, the thread is, is asking for information, and we're not able to satisfy it fast enough. If you experience this, what happens is you'll hear the audio, and it'll just sound very choppy, as if like there are little gaps of space. And that gaps of space is, means that the computer is not able to satisfy the requirements of the sound card fast enough. Now, we do what's called locking a mutex. So a mutex is essentially a mechanism that is used when you have concurrency or, or separate threads running that need to access similar or the same regions of memory. So when we lock the mutex, we're essentially saying anything that depends on that mutex cannot execute further. So we basically say, OK, we're going to lock the mutex. And at that point, we're going to write to the buffer of memory that has been passed to by the callback. Remember the ring buffer. That goes in and gets passed to this function. Now, this is where we fill using the uh, read interleaf stereo function. We pass in the data region, the buffer, that gets essentially sent to us by the callback. And the live mod open MPT will fill that at that point. And then we are essentially storing certain information. So when the mod file fills in the buffer, it's actually advancing the position of the song. So we capture that. And we use that so that we can figure out where we are in the song at some point in the output. That's what gets us to the point where we know exactly what row to print when we're playing back our audio. And then remember I mentioned the ability to copy or siphon off this data. Well, that's done here. Now, the audio is interleaved, which essentially means that it is set up in a way where we have sample for left, sample for right, sample for left, sample for right, sample for left, sample for right, and, and so on and so forth through the duration of the length of the array of floating points. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm saying, we're going to just say, OK, for every two positions, we're going to copy the left and right into their respective local floating point buffers that we have. Now, this is important because this is actually what we use on the Dart side to render those waveforms. So if I were to go back in our terminal and say, go back to Dart, and I call Dart player.dart, and then let's pass in a sound file. Uh, we use main menu here. What is giving Dart the ability to render this waveform data is literally our ability to siphon off the information that is being passed in and created by uh, live mop, excuse me, live open MPT. And so as we'll see in the next video, we take that buffer data and then we use that to draw stuff on screen. And now that we've done all of our operations to writing the, the region of memory, reading the, the region of memory that is the sound buffer, then we can unlock our mutex. Now, this actual uh, program is, is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're not going to go into every single portion. I thought the rendering of audio and how we set that up was pretty important. Um, but let's go ahead and make some modifications so that you can see uh, how this works. So in our example, we have, like I said before, this run uh, function that, that sleeps every 5,000 picoseconds or so. Now, I want to make a change. So if, if I run our example, let's see where, where are we. So we go to lib and then go to uh, open MPT. Oops, excuse me. We go to lib, then lib again, I think it is. Nope, I was right. And then build. So there we go. So open MPT test, and I just type in main menu again. 
OK, I want to do two things. One, when a pattern changes, again, look at our, 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 our mod player. Every, uh, what is it, 32 rows or so, or 64 rows, we have a new pattern. So I want to be able to say, um, every time we enter a new pattern, let's print a, a new line. So let's go ahead and do that by saying, OK, in this if condition. So if our current, the order that we in, so order again is the, 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 number, the pattern number that we're implementing. So orders go 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. If the current order is not the previous order, then let's just go print a new line. And we're going to go back in our directory and just make the library from scratch again. Go back to build, ignore the warnings. Every time we hit the end of the pattern, we should print a new line. There we go. Pattern renders. I don't know why it's not catching up. Let's, let's clear the screen. But we should see every time we enter a new, a new order, a new pattern, we're going to print a new line. OK, well, that's kind of cool, except I actually want to print perhaps the row number. So let's do that by saying, OK, here where we're actually printing the current row, I can type in something like, um, what is it, 0x, zero, zero I think it's like that. And we'll put in the argument of uh, current, what is it, current row. So this is the integer. Why did that not take? There we go. Let's then let's do it by hand. There we go. So I'm now printing out the row number, and we now have a new pattern. Let's now change this up perhaps just a little bit more and say, let's actually print the new pattern number. And then we'll pass in the argument of current pattern. All right, let's recompile and re-execute. And we should see the new pattern or pattern number being rendered. There we go. Pattern 1. OK, so this wraps up the exploration of the C++ side of code. If there are specific questions you have about this implementation, please let us know in the comment section below. In the next video, in the meantime, we put a link to the GitHub repo in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. We'd love to know what you think about this experiment and any additional areas you'd like for us to cover. Please like and subscribe for more content from our labs team.